think it's time to get started. Um, I'm Dusa McDuff of Barnard College, Columbia University in New York, and one of the co-chairs of the program committee. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker, Ingrid Darbyshes. She was born in Belgium and was educated as a physicist at the Free University Brussels, where she obtained a PhD in quantum mechanics in 1980. She came to the United States in the mid-1980s, working first at the Courant Institute for a few years, then Bell Labs for seven years, then Princeton for 16 years, finally moving to Duke University a few years ago, where she's now a professor of mathematics. She's best known for her discovery in the mid-80s of special families of wavelets that made them useful in digital signal processing. She's, since then, she's developed many important applications of these wavelets and also moved on to many other fields that, that we'll discover about. In the process of her career, she's won many awards. To mention a few, she was a MacArthur Fellow. She was elected to the US National Academy of Sciences in 1998. She won the National Academy Award of, in Mathematics in 2000, and she won the Jack Kilby Signal, Signal Processing Medal from the Institute of Electrical Engineers in 2011. Currently, she's also president of the International Mathematics Union. Let's give her a very warm wel welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to be this, uh, the first speaker at this first pro uh, uh, Mathematical Congress of the Americas. And uh, uh, it's a, a wonderful occasion. It's a great initiative. Uh, I look forward to uh, uh, attending many more such congresses in the future. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about uh, now is a topic that on which I have been working in uh, the last few years together with uh, uh, collaborators. Uh, here you see Jaron Lipman, uh, who was then at the time of this picture a postdoc at, uh, at Princeton University where I was still then. He's now a, an assistant professor at the Weizmann Institute and here, without a picture, because you'll be able to see him in vivo, uh, uh, my graduate student, Jesus Puente, who will uh, uh, graduate a few weeks from now, who is uh, originary from this state, uh, uh, so he's a, a local boy, and he'll be presenting a poster in the poster session about his work later, so I recommend that you go. Um, okay, so let me first... Uh, tell you a little bit about uh, this, this topic. So I said computational uh, differential geometry. It's also sometimes called discrete differential geometry, which to me was, a misno was, was kind of a contradiction in terms. I mean, how can you have differential geometry with this notion of smoothness and so on and be discrete at the same time? And the origin of this really comes from uh, problems, I mean, in, uh, uh, in computer graphics. And so let me tell you a little bit about this background in computer graphics, which is really the uh, uh, application domain that has driven this field for uh, a long time, and then go over to the applications in biology. So in computer graphics, which in practice leads to uh, things like Pixar movies, uh, one of the things is that you're looking at animation. Um, now, animation of three-dimensional objects. And uh, that relies on computer graphics. And the computer graphics uses 3D, three-dimensional mesh models of these surfaces. So most of the surfaces that you see in Pixar movies are really mesh models on which then texture is superposed. I mean, these days they're becoming more uh, 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 adventurous and more, more uh, interesting in that they have also very much more complicated things that are animated than just uh, surfaces. I mean, if for those of you who are interested in computer graphics or who have uh, children that drag them to the movies, 
if you remember the movie Brave, I mean, the hair of the heroine was a whole creature that moved and, and, and so on. It's not just a simple surface. Um, in any case, the very first such mesh surface that uh, was, was interesting was the teapot. The teapot is uh, just a, a model of a commercial uh, uh, teapot that was made in uh, many, many decades ago when one of the uh, computer graphics uh, people who was looking at surfaces and so on uh, uh, showed what he was doing to uh, a friend who was not a mathematician and she said, why do you guys look only at these funny surfaces? Why don't you take a real object like this teapot? And so he took the teapot, and this is actually, I stole that from the web, the very first uh, digitization of this teapot. In the meantime, it has become much fancier with many more vertices, and this is a more recent version. It's become an in-joke in these, uh, uh, these computer graphics movies that uh, they also always show the teapot somewhere. So it's one of the games you can do as somebody in the know when you, you get dragged by a child or grandchild to one of these movies to spot the teapot. I mean, it could be a little teapot in a toy set somewhere or so on, but it's usually it's there. Okay, so over the years, these 3D meshes became much more sophisticated. And uh, here are a couple of applications, one for an, an, uh, an architectural uh, context, one for computer-aided design for uh, uh, manufacturing. And here are characters from Pixar movies or other animated movies. Uh, so these two actually showed a, uh, a chronicle uh, uh, transition in what happened in, in, in movies. It, the first Toy Story was animated with NURBS, which are spline surfaces that are knitted together by the right boundary conditions in order to make complicated objects. And uh, uh, so typically Woody or uh, the, the uh, 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 Buzz, Year, uh, Buzz Lightyear, sorry, the, the, the robot in the first Toy Story movie were made of many different NURB surfaces. It made it uh, sometimes difficult to respect those boundary conditions stitching together the surfaces in animation, and so that's why later Pixar moved to a different model uh, that was first illustrated in the figure on the right here, who's called uh, Jerry, of Jerry's Game, which was a little short in which they, uh, they, they experimented with this new technique, and then after it became, uh, they sh saw how much easier it was for the animators, it became the standard for all later Pixar movies. Even Toy Story 2, for Toy Story 2, rather than use the old models for uh, the old figures like Woody and, and Buzz Lightyear, they actually re-digitized them with this new method. So the new method was uh, uh, what's called subdivision. Subdivision surfaces are different uh, in that they are uh, not no longer piecewise polynomial surfaces like the splines are but they are surfaces that are made digitally. So what you do is you have a rule with some control points that let you then define points that are intermediate and again intermediate and so on, and so you build up the surface and you control the smoothness of what you build through the rules that you make for new points. Um, you can then control the smoothness differently in different places and that's how it's possible, for instance, all of Jerry's hand, the whole hand, uh, with the fingers and the fingernails and so on is just one subdivision surface, whereas it would have used uh, uh, lots of, of literal different surfaces that then would be stitched together in order to make the individual fingers. The fingernails would have been another surface and so on. So it was much easier to control these things. And that's so that's why they use now subdivision surfaces. Um, but all these that I've showed you so far were surfaces that were made man-made, generated. Uh, for the applications to bio biology, it will be much more interesting, and for many other applications, to look at surfaces that you put together from first looking at existing objects, a little bit like the teapot. The teapot was just measured and digitized. Now we can scan object, and you can do that with uh, 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 LiDAR, 
I mean, here is a, a little angel uh, object that's being scanned, and or you can do that, and it's a more modern method, with uh, uh, just projecting several bar patterns on the object and taking photographs from different angles. And because you know the what you're projecting and because the flat photographs show you that these lines are now no longer, I mean, if you take the, 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 the here it's shown frontally, but if you take it from the side, the lines will no longer be straight, and that gives you information on the geometry. But whatever way you do, you get uh, a whole cloud point of clouds that give you that surface. Now, when you get that point cloud, the first thing you do with it is uh, you triangulate it. Uh, for uh, computer graphics movies, based on graphic computer graphics based movies, they like to use quadrangles uh, rather than uh, triangles because it turns out that in our everyday life, we have dominant uh, directions. Gravity gives us a dominant vertical and orthogonal to that gives us uh, the, the horizontals uh, give us another dominance. So, and so in most of what we see, actually horizontals and, 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 and verticals dominate. And if you get those right, then uh, you, and, so, and that's much easier to do with quadrilaterals than with, with triangles. So, but in, in, in many other applications, triangles are preferred. Um, and there are ways of, if you have a point cloud, of if you have a surface, and many, many points on a surface, to make a good triangulation, the Lonnie triangulations, uh, that give you triangles that are not too thin and skinny. And so I'll assume that that's given to me. And uh, that can then be used. Here is actually a, 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 an another picture I stole from internet. Um, you see an object that existed, that was scanned. The surface was then uh, uh, digitized, and you see on the computer screen a rendering of that digitized surface. And then finally, it, that digitization was used to, in this case, it was milled and not, not uh, 3D printed, but these days you can 3D print things like that, uh, uh, an object again from the digitization. Okay, now what can you do with these surfaces once you have them? Well, you can use them to manufacture new objects, as we saw. Uh, but you can do plenty of other things. I mean, here you see an example of editing of a surface. So in this case, it's a triangulated surface. You see this camel. You see the triangulation on the top. You see the same surface just rendered without a triangulation, but with different light sources that give you shading and give you an impression of the three-dimensionality of this object. And then some control points have been moved dragging with them the finer level control points, and that's how you can make this whole object start to talk, for instance. I mean, so that's how these, these objects are animated. But we're no longer interested in, in the as applications to biology in, in uh, animating. I mean, I don't want to take, uh, although one could, I suppose, uh, animate uh, the skeleton of, of a dinosaur from a natural history museum, but uh, we want to study it. Now, if you take the same surface, the same object, and you scan it two different times, you're going to get a different cloud point, a different point of, of, of cl uh, a cloud of points. So it's going to give you a different digitized surface. How are you going to recognize that it's the same surface? I mean, it's not an easy question, it turns out. Uh, it's something that people in, in these Pixar movies never have to deal with because they know they made the same, they took the same thing and animated it. But if you have the same object, here I'm showing you these two dice, but imagine I get two dice that are not the same, but that are very similar. How am I going to recognize that they're similar? Imagine that I get, uh, uh, and we'll look at that, at bones or teeth from different animals. I mean, they're from the same species. How am I going to recognize they're from the same species? How am I going to recognize that this is closer to that than to yet another one? Anyway, so deformations of each other. Here, this example actually, it's, an, it's a, a, a funny uh, uh, um, psychovisual like thing. Uh, you see the old Volkswagen uh, Beetle, and you see a dinky toy that was made of the Beetle. Now, you'd think it was just a shrunk version of it, so, but in fact, it turned out when people started making these toy uh, cars, that if you just shrunk shrink the whole beetle, it doesn't look like it's right when it's tiny. I mean, it looks too long. 
So they actually had to snub it a little bit in order to make it look right. So the, the, the small toy is not just a scaled version of the large one in this case. For many cars, you, you can do it, but for the Beetle, it didn't work that way. So how are you going to quantify that difference? Suppose I scanned both. I mean, they're going to be completely different point clouds. How can I compare these? Now, this is going to be interesting for our uh, uh, applications in, in biology, but it's interesting even for animation. I mean, uh, and in fact, in animation, they, when they have humanoid characters and they want to make them move, they want to edit them and so on, they do want to have movements that are similar to human movements. So you could think that they, and they do film characters moving, and then they take that motion and they transplant it to this other model, to this robot or so on. But in practice, they can't just take the 3D object and scan it and then take the motion over. They actually put in reference points. So they film this human character with lots of special points that give coordinates and they then abstract the motion from just those control points and they use those in order to make the characters move. So it's actually an ongoing, it's still an, an, an ongoing uh, uh, project in computer science to try to uh, capture motion without control points. So you can imagine that for animals, for instance, filming an animal and, I mean, then using that in order to animate is an interesting thing. Uh, okay, so to recapitulate, we want to be able to see for the applications I'm going to talk about when two point clouds correspond to the same objects or to very similar sub uh, uh, surfaces. We want to see how, uh, we want to be able to quantify how close two surfaces are from each other or whether two surfaces are more similar then each of them is to yet a third surface. And if similar surfaces are similar, we'd like to be able to find the mapping from one to the other. And that has applications to animation, but you'll see it has its applications to biology. Okay, now, so I want to introduce a distance between surfaces. There are many ways that have been proposed to do that. And uh, most of them use tag points, a little bit like these animation, I mean, the animation of the humanoid character, we use tag points. Similarly, when people try to compare surfaces, they put in tag points. And biologists have been doing this also for many years. Uh, the application I'm going to, to, to talk about is to biological morphology. And uh, in fact, my whole interest in this started uh, some years ago at a social gathering when I was talking with a biologist who was an expert on, 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 on teeth of vertebrates, and um, he explained to me that the way uh, uh, morphologists compare teeth is that they, all these, these bumps that you have on your molars, I mean, that help you in chewing your food, well, they all have different names. And uh, uh, biological uh, morphologists, uh, it takes them two or three years of training to become really good at when given a tooth, recognizing uh, what all these different things are and tagging them. And so, although the digital age has uh, reached them and they typically scan their, uh, their teeth, uh, well, I can tell you more about how that's done because, but they, they typically have these, these high resolution representations of the surfaces. They then, on a computer screen, actually tag the different points with the identity of what they are and that gives them a list of tag points, and then they also have a list of tag points on the corresponding tag points on another surface, which gives them a representation in R3N, where N is the number of tag points, and then they can, in that big Euclidean space, look at the distances. So, uh, which is a very time-consuming thing, and also something that is uh, not, makes it a field that's not so easy to penetrate. A little bit like radiology. I mean, radiologists uh, take years of training in order to reliably detect uh, with, with very good reliability, if you look at statistics, not 100%, but 
uh, detect different conditions that would also be detected by a colleague in the same way. Um, but uh, radiology has to do with human health, and there's a lot more uh, interest and, and, uh, in, in, in that than in morphology of, 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 of teeth. So it, is, it makes the morphology domain a smaller domain, which is harder to penetrate and more subjective also. So they were very, very interested in ways of doing this automatically. I said, well, truly, this must be possible m by mathematical techniques. And little did I know that, it in fact, it's much harder than, than, than you might think. So recent methods in which uh, uh, people have tried to do something automatic with dart attack points have been based on uh, gromov hausdorff distances, which, however, turn out to be something very heavy to compute in practice. And uh, one thing is that as soon as you have something that might be interesting computationally for biologists who have teeth is that they then pull open drawers of museums which are full of them. I mean, you don't want to compare just two or three special surfaces. You want something that you can do fast for wide collections. Okay. And so we, uh, uh, what I'm going to tell you here, I'm going to explain a little bit uh, an, uh, uh, a different approach on which uh, I've worked with uh, Yaron and Jesus, and that has been published. And But we have uh, uh, others uh, as well. With the, 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 the thing that is important to us is that we uh, want to work on, on approaches that are computationally easy to implement and that, will, that are easy to parallelize and so that it's easy to do them on very large data sets. The one I want to uh, show you is, is uh, which, I ha which has very beautiful uh, mathematical ingredients, is based on uh, conformal geometry and mass transport. I mean, two uh, uh, disciplines that have led to many other beautiful applications in mathematics and that I really uh, enjoyed learning about. Okay, so conformal geometry. The idea there was that we wanted to take our surface in 3D and make a flat representation from it because once you're working in a flat representation, things are much easier to search than in this 3D space. So the basic tool you have there is that whenever you have a nice surface embedded in R3, you of course have a geometry on it that we teach our students in multivariable calculus. You can compute distances, you can compute all kinds of things. Uh, and that Riemann surface, it's really an example of a Riemann surface, has a conformal structure that it inherits from the, the, the geometry in three space. You have angles, and so you can conformally map that to the disk. We're looking at, at teeth surfaces, so you could go to the sphere if there's no hole, or to the disk if you have a rim. I, uh, if, if, if you have no rim, a compact surface with no hole and no rim, you could map it to the disk if you just have a rim and no holes. And for surfaces with holes, uh, uh, you, you, you would then uh, first uh, go to the, uh, uh, to the universal covering and then do the flattening. Um, Okay, so, but that's the continuous surface for which you can do that. We want to work discreetly because we want to have algorithms in which we can compute. So the first thing that you think of, well, is I'll triangulate my surface and I'll approximate this conformal flattening on the surface. And that's not what we do. In practice, actually, and this is a, a point on one uh, which I want to dwell a little bit, because I think it is uh, uh, an important point that we are seeing in many different branches of uh, uh, computational mathematics now. Uh, it used to be that when you had something nice and smooth, you would try to approximate it to very high order and then work with that approximation. And because you had a high order approximation, you still had something very close to the surface and so you expected to inherit in your discrete computations much of many of these beautiful properties of your original surface in this case, or image if you do image analysis, or uh, dynamics if you do uh, symplectic calculations, and so on. Um, it turns out that it is better to look at, your, at, at the mathematics, the full mathematics that you have understood in the continuum, and then build 
on the discrete level something that has that structure rather than try to make a good, a very high uh, uh, resolution approximation and hope that the structure will be inherited to a sufficient extent that you can still exploit it. So what am I meaning by this? So if I want to take this surface, for instance, and I want to make a flattening of it, so I want to preserve angles. I have all these triangles, my triangulated surface, and I want to preserve angles, so every one of those triangles will be represented by a conformal triangle, by a triangle that is similar, that has the same angles. It could be expanded or contracted a bit, but which is the conformal factor that you also have when you uh, uh, do the uniformization of the surface to the disk. Um, but you can't do that with this triangulated surface. I mean, these triangles have edges in common. If I want to keep these edges in common, then it's very easy to see that the only thing I can really do that preserves, preserves that whole edge commonality and vertex commonality is a, is a scaling of the whole surface. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, represent this discrete surface in a different way. And one way of doing that is to use the mid-edge point triangle. So what you do is for every one of those little triangles, I choose the midpoints on its three edges. And that makes a little triangle in the middle, which is of course similar to its parent. And I now can do that on my whole surface. I have now a different triangulation, a triangulation in which all these little green triangles encode the geometry I had before. And, uh, but they don't have edges in common anymore. They just have vertices in common. But the whole topology of what uh, triangle is next to what triangle and so on is all here. And now I can take this, this mid-edge triangle mesh where because I only have edges, uh, vertices in common, and I can now play with those triangles. I can try to expand and contract them in such a way that I keep the connectivity, this lace uh, of, the, of the whole thing, and flatten it. So here you have actually a, a surface that is a blown up version of a tooth, and I have this mid-act tri triangle mesh for a tooth. And here on the left, again, you have, I mean, people at the front may can see the, the, the edges. At the back, you'll, you'll, you'll just see a very gray thing and I have drawn all these little green mid-edge triangles. Okay, so I have all these little mid-edge triangles and I'm going, and you can compute how to, to, how, how to, to get all this flat and it's not a, a difficult computation. I want, I have an edge to this whole construction. I would like to put that to the disk. So of course you could flatten the whole thing and you get this frayed edge and then you could, I mean, we know that there are ways of doing that, map that conformally to the disk. But uh, this is a, a very nice, uh, uh, I'm going to show you a very nice little trick that illustrates how powerful it can be to actually build a discrete approximation, a discrete structure that imitates the continuous structure rather than an approximation. So. This is a, 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 a trick that uh, uh, was, was used for different applications of conformal geometry. Um, what's done here is, so if you take this whole thing with the rim, then the rim means that you have triangles that were not, that didn't have a neighboring triangle that, that had an edge in common anymore. So it means that you have a little mid-edge triangle that isn't attached to anything else. It has two neighbors, uh, two, uh, two of its vertices, but the third one doesn't have a, a thing anymore. So let's call those, let's, let's paint those little uh, 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 vertices red, the ones that were on the rim. In order, instead of trying to flatten as is, let's try to do the following trick. Let's try to take any triangle away in the middle of my surface. And what I'm doing is I'm taking that triangle away and I'm going to put that as a triangle over infinity. That means that the, two, the three edges, the three vertices, will be vertices that will now lie 
at the three extremes of my flattening. And those are here. I hope this will be visible. Not very, but so you see one here, here, and here. So the triangle over infinity goes from here and arrives back there. Now, what that has done is it has mapped all the little red points of my rim to red points in the middle of my structure. And they're all here. Now, what was done in order to do this flattening was to define on the discrete structure on the tooth a conformal thing, a conformal structure in which you, you have uh, directions, special directions, and their orthogonal directions, which you can define on these triangles. And those were the ones that were used in order to do the flattening. Those were the ones for which everything was preserved. So those had to map to, so you build a kind of discrete complex structure, which you then mapped to the complex structure on the plane. And you can prove if you do that. So you don't try to do a high re resolution approximation. You just try to preserve that discrete complex structure. You can prove that if you do that, then all these, these rim points map to a straight line. So we've mapped the whole thing to something, to a slit plane. And we know it's then a standard conformal, regardless of the surface you started from, it's always now the same conformal mapping to map the split plane to the disk. And so we don't have to do this, this, this special conformal thing of a, a, a weird shaped flat object to the disk. It's already built in very nicely. This was just a site to illustrate how it can be useful to exploit this mathematical uh, structure. Okay, so when you do that, so here are two examples in computer graphics where uh, people have uh, uh, the same structure but with parts of it moved. So this is the cat in different positions. Uh, and if you put, make this flattening in, in a conformal flattening in the disk, then you see that even though the two uh, structures are not isometric because, well, we have moved things. And you can see here that the triangle structure, for instance, is really different. You can nevertheless see that special features are very recognizable from one to the next. I mean, here you have two feet, the tail, the head and the legs actually, uh, 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 the head and the front legs are all here. So in seeing this, the idea was, well, after the conformal flattening, maybe you can recognize and you can then use a mapping from one to the next. Now, I've cheated a little bit here because there's, I'm uh, doing all this conformal stuff. There is no unique way to make a conformal mapping to the disk. In fact, if once you are on your disk, you can just map the disk to itself by a conformal map uh, well and, and keeping the, the, the rim of the disk uh, uh, invariant, and you have still a three-parameter family for doing that. And so uh, things could look very different. And in fact, if you, uh, if you do two different uh, uh, flattenings of this cat, you find this and this. So what you then have to do is you have to explore for one of them all the conformally equivalent variants in order to see the one that looks the most like it. Okay, so... That's actually what we did in, 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 in this, this, this one tooth, in this tooth construction. We first flatten. We then have that conformal factor, which tells us for every triangle how much it was uh, extended or, or shrunk on, on the disk. So we have a little landscape that encodes the original geometry on the disk. And we are uh, going to, uh, I'm going to go quickly over these formulas. Uh, uh, what, what we are going to do is we're now going to compare two surfaces by doing a mass transport. We have one landscape for one surface, another landscape for another surface. We are going to say, look, how much, what is the minimum way of moving mass around from one to the next surface so that I make this one look like that. Of course, I have to do this in a conformally invariant way. So mass transport, what mass transport does is it says, uh, if I have two measures, mu and nu, then you can look at uh, the distance, I mean, 
So I have my two surfaces x, y. I have a way of looking at distances between points. Then I look at all the possible uh, probability densities that I can define on the product of those two spaces that have the correct marginals and that minimize this transport distance. And we have to do this uh, conformally invariant and we want to be robust for everything. And we want to be able to compute. So what, uh, what we found is that the most natural thing to do if you want invariance under group action is to actually quotient that group out. If you do that, then uh, you can by, by transporting, so you quotient out, so you take an inf over the whole group here, you can actually pull that in to the, the, the measures, that whole transport. I mean, uh, so, so the, the inf m, there's one particular one for which it minimizes. If you use that particular one, which depends on your original measures, you can pull it in. And so you can write a new formulation that says there must be a particular measure here, a particular uh, uh, transport here, a particular mapping for which uh, uh, this is achieved. So what it shows is that you have something like the original mass transport, but with something that is dependent on the two things you want to compare. So we took that as an illustration in order to mimic what we feel the biologists do. So what do the biologists do? They have these surfaces and they compare, I mean, the way they identify these different localities, these stack points, is by looking at neighborhoods and properties of neighborhoods and also how these neighborhoods relate with each other. So the idea was let's look at neighborhoods of two points we want to compare and see how similar these neighborhoods are. And we have to do that in a conformally invariant way. And we can do that. That defines us now something that de depends on, on, on what we started out with, and that gives us a similarity distance between points. So then using that as a reference distance, we can say, well, how much would we have to massage this one in order to get to the other one? And you can compute all that, and so in order to do that, you have to approximate your conformal factors, you have to have quadrature formulas, you have to discretize, you have to optimize, and so on. It can all be done via fast computations. And so we, we ended up with a distance between surfaces. Um, and we call this the conformal Wasserstein neighborhood distance. Um, we also looked at uh, another way of comparing distances, uh, which again uh, looks at a simplification of the surfaces and tries to imitate what biologists do. Uh, we then have to, afterwards, I mean, it's all very nice to come up with these numbers, but you have to test them for biologists. I mean, so what did we do? Well, we, in the course of, of, of looking at similar surfaces, we define mappings between similar surfaces. So one way of testing this was to actually look at the, uh, uh, and, and, and this illustrates that, was to take, here you have a, 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 a tooth, a molar, and you would label all these different points you would then use the mapping from one surface to another that we compute in our similarity, and you would use that to propagate those points. And you would then look at what those, what the tag points would be, the analogous tag points that the biologists had put. And it turned out you could then compare these two by looking at the distance in R3n, as I described earlier. We did that also, we were asked by the reviewer to do this for different bones than just teeth, so for uh, the radius, for a metatarsal, and so on. And we found that this is a, 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 a this is for the teeth, this is a, a matrix uh, figure that shows you the similarity between what the, the distance was between samples by computed by the biologists R3N distance, and the distance, oops, sorry, 
uh, the distance that we computed. So every point here is a pair of two, is, is, is a surface. Every point here is another surface. And then you find on the intersection the distance that we computed. And of course, by, I mean, you have the same pair by symmetry with respect to diagonal here. And then you find the distance. The color code is that deep blue is very small. And then as you go further to the other extreme of the, the rainbow, you get further away. So what you have here is showing that when the distances are small, when things are very similar, we have ordered them so that you neighbors are always more similar than things that are far apart. We, we are very, very similar to uh, uh, what, what, what the biologists find. And this was our first test, and it was uh, a very exciting thing. And it was already immediately, I mean, biologists, uh, they're interested in new tools and new things and so on, but they're only interested in those if they can lead them to answering new questions that they couldn't answer before. And so one thing that Doug Boyer, the biologist uh, who we were working with, asked us was to then apply this to a controversial uh, a situation in, in his field. This was a case where, two, where, where um, if you compared two teeth of, a, uh, 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 of, of, of two uh, uh, mouse lemurs, uh, you found that the way of mapping uh, uh, this particular feature here would be naturally fitted here but uh, people felt that that natural configuration was probably not the right one from an evolutionary point of view. So he asked us to look at what our mappings would find if instead of going the whole way from one example to the other, we would go via intermediate paths. And he proposed two intermediate paths, one via one fossil, which is an, an, an uh, extinct ancestor of both, and another path via two extant still living uh, uh, animals that, uh, however, are each more closely related, so with smaller hops, if you want. And what we found was that both via the extinct ancestor or via the uh, closer, more close, uh, uh, a route that was more closely related here, we found that indeed things mapped from this feature to this uh, uh, so it was an, 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 an entoconid that mapped, uh, that, that was really a metastylid. I mean, for, for those of you who, are, uh, who know this vocabulary, I mean, and I have to confess that these are the only two uh, words that I have learned of this vocabulary myself. But so they were very excited that this gave them a way of quantifying things for which before they only had qualitative discussions. Now, we, in the meantime, uh, we, we, uh, we are very excited. So this showed uh, to us how important it was to look to, from, to things, to neighboring, to hop over small distances. And in fact, that inspired uh, 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 Jesus in his thesis to propose that we would look with our distances at the minimum spanning tree of this data set. Because then you have a connection you can go to very things that are very far apart, but only using small hops. And it is something that is, pr is, is, is proving to be very uh, interesting and give useful correspondences. And he has developed an automatic alignment of, 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 uh, uh, of different uh, specimens, even ones that can be very far apart, using, just like the biologists do, the fact that you don't just have two bones, but you have your knowledge of this whole wide family. Um, we are now, I'm now working uh, with uh, 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 a younger si uh, academic sibling of Jesus at Duke University um, on, on the next step mathematically from here. Because think of it, you have all these teeth are little realizations with the parameters and with the environment that acted on its own of this whole manifold of teeth, if you look at all the possible parameters that can influence the teeth, the mammalian teeth, then it's highly likely that you have a very noisy but manifold because you have factors that play a continuous role. There might be some accidents here and there, but still. 
Um, so we have all these different points. We have a now a distance that the biologists really believe is close to a distance that they can trust when we look at small distances. And we, but we don't only have these teeth as just points on our manifold. Each of these teeth is a 2D surface. So we really have a fiber bundle. And we have, as a, in, in the process of defining our, 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 our distance, we define a mapping. So we have a connection on the fiber bundle. And this connection, this example that I show you here, shows that the connection is not a flat connection, meaning if I go one way and I come back, I won't have the identity map. So it's going to be interesting to actually study the deviation from flatness of that connection. And so we're in the process of trying to quantify all that. It's, it's, it's uh, also uh, highly likely that uh, we will be able, I mean, and that's what biologists would like to do, do a fine and coarse graining. I mean, see if you look at just the neighborhood, can you go uh, uh, further away than if you look at the whole tooth uh, in, in, in finding this deviation from uh, a flat connection? And so I think, I think they're really interesting mathematical questions. I think it is, uh, uh, I mean, it's a project I'm very excited about. It has, uh, uh, and if I, I wish I had more time right now, but after my um, new job is over, I, I intend to take a, an intense year of, of uh, steeping myself in differential geometry again. It had been more than a quarter century ago that I worked on that. So, uh, um, so I think it's, it's uh, an example of how interactions with scientists, it all started at a cocktail party, uh, can lead to really interesting uh, projects and questions that are really interesting mathematically as well. Applied mathematics, some people think that applied mathematics leads to mostly ancillary uh, uh, work that is great for the field to which it's applied, but is mathematically not interesting. And I believe that whenever you really invested in it, I mean, you can distill really interesting mathematical questions, and that's where we are now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid, for an absolutely fascinating talk. I, I, I love it, really great. <laughs> I think it's not a good venue to have questions. You'll be here the whole week and very happy to answer any questions anybody has. So let's thank her again.